Um, just my background, I am by education a aerospace engineer, not a computer scientist. I've learned all this myself. And I de googleified pretty much everything. I don't run on Google's cloud anymore over the last year and a half. Basically, web searches and figuring out how to do it. I am not a complete authority. This is just stuff I've picked up. And uh, given Snowden and everything, I think people are interested should they be on the cloud or not? What's the exposure you're looking at for your data? So, de Googleify. I'm talking about being off of third party public clouds. If it is your cloud on your server, on your property, you're still pretty much okay. There's nothing fundamentally flawed with the technology. The problem is much more, much like DRM, proprietary, uh, and other technologies, it's the legal implications that tend to come around and bite you. So, a lot of people, who's here have used Gmail? <laughs> Google Docs. <laughs> Calendar. <laughs> Pretty much most of us. And for a while there, it was an excellent choice. However, these are better choices. You'll note a lot of these are email based. Email is a special case that I'm going to pay particular attention to. But, you know, you can run instead of Google Docs, LibreOffice close in, own cloud has some collaborative editing. Uh, and you can sync your files without using something like Dropbox. Those would all be things you'd want to avoid. Why? Anyone have any ideas why you might want to avoid? Surveillance. They might just go away one day. Yeah. Might go away. Because if it's free, you're the product. They are making money off of your data. In aggregate, our data is worth significant amounts of money. Your medical records retail on the black market for $200 a pop. And they're available because not everyone is good at security. Do you think your doctor is going to be checking about thumb drives he's plugging in to the electronic medical records? Probably not. And the big companies are Better at security, keeping bad guys out, but they are legally obligated to let certain other folks in. <clears throat> in the United States, we have a third party doctrine that was established in law and says that you do not have a reasonable expectation of privacy when you give your data to a third party at all. The whole you have a reasonable expectation of privacy when you're going to a changing room or a restroom, but you don't have it on a public street. They're basically treating a lot of your data up on servers like it's in public, even if you're connecting over SSL. And with that no reasonable expectation, government agents that aren't courts without a warrant can issue an su administrative subpoena and request your documents for, because I feel like it, pretty much. And there are agencies like, the Drug Enforcement Agency is, was pretty much given carte blanche to go ahead and subpoena as much as they wanted. Congress can subpoena. And if they're just a person with that power, they can abuse it. I mean, picture here, J. Edgar Hoover, former FBI director for a very long time went around the reasonable expectation of privacy and did things like wiretap civil rights leaders, keep files on them, blackmail congressmen, just an individual, and other individuals working for the government can do similar things. If Snowden can walk off with their secrets, someone else can walk off with your private data they collected. Now, email is an interesting case. 1967, U.S. versus Katz. The Supreme Court found it was unreasonable 
and a violation of an expectation of privacy to just put phone taps on public telephone booths. Guy was convicted for placing illegal gambling bets uh, via payphone. Case what the US Supreme Court ruled, they can't just tap a public uh, telephone booth. There's an expectation of privacy even, and this was what the government tried to say is, because their tap was outside the booth, it wasn't a search. They will manipulate the language of laws. NSA is particularly egregious. So, 1982, the first standardization of SMTP in an RFC. We start getting our email working. Almost no one has a computer. 1984, we get the POP protocol for downloading your messages from other servers to one you're probably time sharing on. Two years later, they passed the law that says emails that are left on a third party server, <coughs> unopened, are no longer subject to a reasonable expectation of privacy. They are merely covered by the third party doctrine. Now, that also covers emails that you open and leave on that third party server. So that means you opened that Gmail message on, through their web interface, and by that act of opening, they can now search it. And two years later is when we get that IMAP protocol we're all using to, because we're all keeping things up on servers now. Before that, space was premium. So that's the government side. Security-wise, if you can control the clients, you can restrict it tighter. Google can't require that everyone be using an up-to-date browser that can support TLS 1.2. They have to allow 1.11, and they used to allow SSL 3, because they want more compatibility. They're making money with more users, not on your security. You can choose a bigger key size if it's you doing it for devices you own and control and can choose how to do it. Further, you're a smaller target than Google and your data is worth less than most companies that you can probably do better than. They're picking off, for mal actors that aren't government, they're picking off the slowest guys that have data that's worth more than you. If you can just stay ahead of them, you don't have to be perfect so long as you're not making egregious mistakes. But you do have to pay attention, and it's really hard to trust what's good. For if anyone's heard Debian's doing reproducible builds, one of the big problems is how do you trust your compiler hasn't been backdoored to produce a backdoor compiler when you're compiling the new version? <laughs> it's hard. And trusting someone else is hard. And we do that with free software all the time, but at least it's open and we can look at the code. Reliability. Google Reader, I use that. It shut down. LavaBit, one of Snowden's emails carriers. The government actually did go for a warrant and tried to take the TLS private key so they could read everything. He said, no, no, give me an email. I might give you Snowden's email specifically, but not in perpetuity. You're going to have to keep coming back. They said, no, he shut down rather than compromise his user's security. But that meant if you were relying on an email for the next day coming through that, out of luck, third party. <coughs> and if they're writing terms of ser service, they're writing them to cover their backsides against your lawsuit. So even if it would be reasonable for you to sue in a normal course of business, because you agreed to that long terms of service that you don't read, you're stuck. <coughs> But with open source, even if it's discontinued, you still have access to it if you can find someone to pay to keep working on it while you're transitioning to something new, that is even an option. If you have the finances or you could learn how to do it. But you have the option to switch slowly also if it's on your own server. You can move at the pace that's comfortable for you. So, how? Email. 
two most things we use, SMTP, how it moves between the servers. Now, a problem with running email at your home. You probably have an IS, there's a chance your ISP may block SMTP, the port. It's less common than it used to be because most people running uh, mail servers have spam filters that have the residential addresses blocked as do not receive from. So you have to go through a few hoops if you want to use a residential connection. Interestingly, I've been running one for a year and a half now at home, and I've rarely gotten spam, probably because I'm considered a spammer when they look at my first MX record. My second one is a static, and I'll tell you later how I did that. Now, when your phone's accessing, to read your emails, you're using IMAP or POP. Most of us use IMAP because then you can access from multiple devices, or POP downloads locally. Uh, those are almost never blocked, and you can pretty much use it from anywhere. Email. These are some common, solid SMTP uh, software you can get. Send mail was wicked common. Hard to configure. I recommend not using it if you're learning. Or maybe ever. Uh, <laughs> Postfix is very common now in free software. Um, and they've done pretty good on security. Their config files are on the long side, and there's a bunch of them. Conf.d directory with 10, 20, 40. Uh, a lot of options, and you might feel bogged down under them. XM's popular, really good for if you need scale. If you're a business, you probably want to look at that one. Uh, Open SMTBD is from the uh, OpenBSD guys behind the uh, SSH implementation most of us use. They do a lot of privilege separation. It's solid and the configs are easy, very easy. <laughs> As in six, eight lines. And they're clear. So I highly recommend that if you're trying the first time. Either that or Postfix. Those are my two recommendations. IMAP, Dovecot solid. Cyrus works too. Dovecot's been getting a lot of attention. Bug updates are consistent. Uh, if you need webmail, you can have a PHP webmail that basically logs in like your phone's client does. And you can run it on a server that doesn't necessarily have the rest of the, web, the mail on it. You probably want to separate those for security since those are typically PHP apps. Best for security to keep them separate. Uh, Brown Cube has a modern interface. Squirrel is kind of 90s-ish, but they still are developing, so they're still good to use if you're perhaps resource limited a bit. Contacts, calendars. WebDev, which is built into Apache but turned off by default, has been extended to CardDev and CalDev. This is under the hood what Google's using anyway. So it's just adding your own back end. Uh, DeviCal and Radical are both standalone solutions where you're implementing just that on that single server. You're not trying to mix other things. It is optional installs for own cloud. You can add that to an existing own cloud instance. DevDroid is an open source app available on the FDroid store that can let you use your CalDev and CardDev servers it integrates right with the contacts and uh, calendar apps native to Android. Works like a charm. Uh, document editing. There are other options out there, but for one you can host, and that's rather easy to set up and well documented. On Cloud works. They don't quite have like bubble comments off to the side that work well, I haven't found, but uh, if you need to do simple ODF work, it can handle it. File syncing. Bunch of options. OwnCloud can do it. They're uh, quite capable. I've used it for hundreds of gigabytes of data between Windows, Linux, bunch of other FreeBSD systems. Um, but it's a server client 
type setup. So the server is where the, they both keep copies of the data and if you're, say, keeping a copy for a uh, local user on your server, perhaps you're doing a file share NFS, it can be tricky to set up. Uh, for something like that, you might want to go a sync thing, which is a, uh, everyone's a client tech. Uh, they both handle uh, revisioning and contact handling, so they can do layered revisions even on an EXT file system. Uh, in the event you're not running something that does snapshots or something itself. Um, you could even roll your own doing something with Git. Like if you're doing collaborative documents and you can afford to not be XML based and go line by line, Git's a good solution for working with other <coughs> folks and syncing your files between different computers. Uh, another good multi-computer sync that offers two-way sync is Unison. Now you can use rsync and other things, but these all offer a two-way sync or some of them you can set to one way, but they at least let you, for instance, I use sync thing at home. I'll be working on a file on my desktop. I get up, I move to my laptop. By the time I've woken up my laptop, wait a minute or so, the file's right there across the land. Except it says third party. If you're running these on your server, which is your property, it does have a reasonable expectation. What if you're using a VPS? Unknown. <laughs> it's new and we're not sure what's going to happen. Um, yeah, if it's, you probably have to keep it encrypted the whole time it's on there and in transit. So, yeah, that would get you around it, but I wouldn't presume it's safe, with the exception of emails going to and from, unread emails that are just bouncing through and not spending too long in the, on there. Those do have a reasonable expectation of privacy. They are the exception, as far as I can tell. There is law, statute, that requires that they be Consider private. File sharing. You need to share with other folks. A web server works. You can actually set up, you know, if, if you're on a LAN, do a uh, S, uh, NFS or SSHFS mount to a directory on your web server, and you can set up password files per directory pretty much and just share those out if you need to ship a big file rather than attaching it to an email. It's probably a bit nicer because everyone can download it with a web server or whatever client they're comfortable with. Or OwnCloud has an option for uh, public, you know, here's a link, and if you have just the link with the uh, specific URL key, it'll let you through. But it kind of is what web servers are meant for. You could use FTP, but I don't like FTP because uh, it doesn't work well with uh, packet filtering firewalls. So, yeah. Uh, general questions? Anybody? Um, so I have got kind of a personal setup where I've been trying to run my own mail server, and something I've run into a lot is when I send mail outgoing, even though I've done DKIM SPF, my mail gets marked as spam by receivers. Okay. The way around that problem. Can you please repeat the question? Okay. Problem is, if you have an SMTP server at your home network, chances are your IP address is flagged as residential and that most spam filters, uh, and particularly the spam host one is egregious, uh, will say everything from these residential addresses is always spam without looking. So the way around that is, let me go back to The Electronic Communications and Privacy Act does allow, because it's not a left on a server unopened for, that, I didn't write it here, it's uh, six months, yeah, 180 days by statute. If it's unopened on a third party server or if it's uh, been opened, it's 
no reasonable expectation, but before that you do. So if you have an outgoing server from you, what you do is you set up a relay on like a VPS with a static IP, and you can bounce your emails right off that. And you might even set that as your secondary MX in case your home internet goes down. If you set that up as a secondary MX, that can cache all those emails. And you can pretty much expect you'll be up in 180 days at somewhere, be able to update your MX for primary MX, and it'll send them on. So you don't have any emails bouncing back and forth. They'll all come to that server. And you would, under statute at least, have a reasonable expectation. Next question. Uh, I was just going to add to that. When, you're, when, you're, when you need to relay mail outbound, there, you know, there's a few ways to do it. I relay mail through my work server on the mm -hmm. slide and things. But there are some services out there where you can pay them a fee for relaying so many emails per month or per year or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, it's a pain, but that's really the only way to get around yeah. some of these uh, anti spam mm -hmm. measures. And that, that would be probable that you'd have a reasonable expectation of expectation of privacy. You would have a case in court if, some, if the government violated that. Um, and actually what I do is I, I have a $5 VPS a month up on DigitalOcean. That's what I use for it. It's pretty com com comparative to that, and I can do a few things like uh, check whether my websites are working off. <coughs> So you can use it for mixed use without well, running it under for a couple home emails. Do you uh, break out laughing every time you read about Hillary Clinton's email? <laughs> <laughs> Either someone hasn't told Congress about how sysadmins do backups, or someone's very incompetent. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Perhaps. From a security point of view? Uh, <coughs> It's probable I mean, that they do it right. I mean, the top message. secret, the methods they use for taking care of top secret information pretty much are public. They're basically use AES with big key sizes. <laughs> <laughs> right, you, the, the technology that they're using is not fundamentally different, but the choice to use it, I don't know. But since there is statute that if you're doing work for the government, your emails belong to them, just like when you're doing work as an employee, your emails belong to your employer if you're using their email. What about using these services where you can say connect to friends or families and peer services? Um, yeah, if you're connecting to a peered network, like... Uh, say, say, say someone else is running the same kind of stuff. Yeah, if exchange. some other individual Friends, probably no. Family, first degree, nuclear family, probably you have a reasonable expectation. They're probably not covered as a third party. Friends might be. I could see them pushing that. <laughs> Do you have any comments about using um, services hosted outside the US? Specifically, I'm using Proton Mail. Um, if you're on a service outside the U.S., it is certain that the NSA is looking closer. Uh, <laughs> I mean, if they're doing encryption right, they're doing encryption right. Uh, but it's a third party, and you can bet they're sucking. But then again, the, you know, they may be routing through GCHQ if you're in the U.S., so... <laughs> it's a you got to do it right kind of a problem. And you have to do it yourself because... They won't let anyone else do it for you, even for the right price, unfortunately. Any other questions? I'm not sure if you answered this already, but what about if you host your own email on a VPS server? If you set up something like a Linode or something, and you set up your own server, mm -hmm. your personal server, but it was hosted on a third party site. OK, so if you're using a third party VPS, basically you've done all the setup. It's been your work, your effort. Basically, they're just providing hardware. Uh, I really, it's hard to say. Um, my guess is they might push it in that they would probably say that the blocks of data on the server count as a business record, which is how they're doing it. All of these laws came from prohibition. They were trying to 
get the lobsters via money laundering. So they said, you have no reasonable expectation of privacy as to your savings and checking accounts, things that we consider most private. <laughs> and it's all cascaded from that. Questions? All right. Um, if you're not interested, you can go ahead and leave. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to demo Roundcube and uh, OwnCloud here for folks that want to see the interfaces. So this is just a local setup I did last night um, that is just a demo user. No real security, not HTTPS or anything. I have a real one at home, but I wasn't going to count on connectivity here. Um, Could you increase the font size then? Yeah. The zooming should work, although I'll note, OwnCloud has been a little bit imperfect about text riding over other text or icons. <coughs> I don't know if as much can be done aside from more devs, it would be nice. Uh, but, so, you know, basically these documents, you can have them sync to a folder, you can do partial syncs of these folders to your file system. They have clients that run for Linux desktops and Windows boxes, probably Mac, so whatever. Uh, so you have uh, documents, you have these apps, they have a, you know, basically an app store setting, but it's more like download the files and drop them in the right directory, like a lot of PHP apps. So you get a calendar, you can go ahead and uh, create events. And this calendar you can have sync to your, you know, if you're using Evolution or K KDE's calendar or whatever, they'll work fine. Um, I have had trouble with um, contacts. If you're using the Lightning extension for Thunderbird, has some restrictions on like the number of, uh, I believe it was email addresses. It started clipping them randomly based on which one was last and deleting them from my other ones in a two-way sync setup. Although I'll note that was with an earlier version of the two-way sync, which might have been fixed by now. I gave up though. <laughs> so yeah, make a contact. The multiple document editing. So yeah, basic rich texty kind of ODF document editor here. Um, I wrote one line here was a, I wrote as the root user and the other I wrote as the demo user and you just have kind of a share and you can other users on the system you can add to this box. There's a way to federate these, although that would kind of break your third party problem, uh, which is a problem in law. Although it should be known that uh, Justice Sotomayor did mention in a concurrence to a previous opinion that the Supreme Court may look at revisiting the third party doctrine. But that is not law yet, so you're not protected. Anyway, you got this uh, shared link and you can drop that into an email for the document and <coughs> someone with the link can open it, or download it rather. So that's OwnCloud and Roundcube. So this is your Gmail replacement if you needed web access. Um, of course, you know, same OPSEC problems of you're on a strange computer where you didn't bother to configure your own client. Uh, so, emails. It doesn't look terrible, although it looks like we're clipping. I didn't realize that. That's it over scan. Yeah, stupid over scan. <laughs> Um, so, does anyone have anything they'd like to see besides these? Any other questions? I was curious how well counter events will, uh, I guess, federate from Google accounts that might be shared to you. Hmm?
say that one more time. If someone shares a Google event to you or something like that, how will that federate the home file, especially if you use your own browser with it? So when someone sends you an invite to a Google uh, from their Google Calendar, typically you get a uh, ICS file with that invite, and you can just import that like you would to a local calendar on the local machine. And if the local calendar you picked is the one that you're syncing with uh, CalDev, it'll sync right up to your server perfect. Uh, you may 